Presented by Caltech. The event that we're having today is a transfer of a lot of historic artifacts to the archives here at Caltech. It's a story that hasn't been told. Uh, it starts out in 1965. I was consulting for Gordon Moore at Fairchild, but I had known Gordon since uh, 1959 and had consulted with him at Fairchild since it was a very small company. And Gordon always thought way ahead. He is a, a very, very big picture kind of person. And one day I came in and he showed me that picture. Starts out in 1959 with a single transistor. Then this is one of the very first integrated circuits in 1960, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65. And he showed me this picture and he said, you know, they're getting to make more complicated integrated circuits every year. So of course, he's Gordon. So what did he do? He plotted how many transistors there were on each of those as a function of the year. And he made a log plot just the log to the base two, of course, because it's scored as a function of the year, and he noticed it's a straight line, and he just extrapolated that. And so Gordon made the leap of faith that you could make transistors smaller so you could put more of them on an area, and they would still work, and also people would get better at the process by which they make these things, so the yield would get better. And if they could do both of those things, which was a huge if, then the economics were absolutely compelling. And it was a week or two or so later, he said, Carver, you're working on electron tunneling. I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, now that's something that happens when when things get very small, right? I said, yeah. He said, well, won't that prevent transistors from getting smaller than a certain size? And Good I question. said, yes, it certainly will. And Gordon said, well, how small is that? And I swallowed really hard. I'll have to work it out, Gordon. <laughs> I can tell you from what I know right now that the gate oxide isn't going to be real comfortable if it gets much below 50 angstroms, but I'll have to get exactly what those things are. The papers in the literature were full of all the things that were going to prevent you from getting smaller. So, of course, I puzzled over this. So, 1968 was a watershed year. I had finally figured out a simple way of looking at the physics of Moore's Law, and that was this little piece of physics. And the bottom line was that as you made the devices smaller, you had to scale the voltage down proportionally. But if you did that, the devices got faster, they dissipated less power, and everything got better. And the figure of merit, how much computation you could get done for a given amount of power, went like the cube of the scaling factor. So here we were with a long runway without changing anything except just making everything smaller. That was a huge aha for me. And what it meant was we were going to have things with millions of transistors on. No one had ever made a machine with millions of moving parts and we were going to be doing that. And how in the world could you design a thing that had millions of moving parts and ever get it to work? But another thing happened that year, which was very inspiring to me. Barney Oliver, old Caltech alumnus, who was the chief technical officer at Hewlett Packard, came down and gave a seminar. And what he did was he showed their latest calculator. And it was a thing of beauty. 
you could do all the scientific calculations with it. It had all the trigonometric functions. And it had a little space up here where you could put in a little magnetic card. It had memory for programs that were just sequences of the key pushes. And of course, what it was for was for people like me to take our data and reduce the data. And this was the machine I talked to Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore about and trying to convince them that this was going to be the future. There was going to be something like that on everybody's desk. And this is what integrated circuits were going to be for. Meanwhile, I was furiously learning how to design digital stuff. And I got pretty good at it pretty fast because I spent every waking hour doing that. Well, the other thing I do when I get to where I understand it myself a bit is I teach a course on it because there's nothing like teaching a course that helps you master a topic. If you're going to teach a course, you have to build something real. So I chose the calculator because a calculator is the thing everybody understands. At that time, electronic calculators were just getting popular because they were getting affordable. And yet they were complex enough that they exercised everything that you needed to know about digital logic. They weren't a computer, but they were close. So this is a picture of me teaching a freshman class in digital logic, teaching about how you get data into a digital system. And you'll see me here with my finger on a little keyboard. And it's a keyboard very much like the keyboard on the Hewlett Packard 9100, that little calculator. You have to be able to get data out. You can see the display it has. Each position where there can be a number, there's a little thing called a seven segment display. So these, each of these segments can be lit up independently. And here's A, B, C, D, E, F, and then G is in the middle. And these segments can be lit up to make all the digits. And you can see that the number one has segment B and C lit up and so forth. And we went through this in, in class and we designed the logic circuit that went with each segment. And by the time it was done, when I'd press a key, it would light up the character. One of my very best TAs was a guy by the name of Richard Willis. He was just terrific. And we together hatched the idea that we should turn this course into a book and teach the very basic knowledge of how you reason through from something, a function that you want to create to a digital system that creates that function. That's the absolute ground training you need before you design any of these integrated circuits. Intel was being hatched at exactly the same time as I was making this transition. In my head was always true that what I was doing was developing a way of thinking that was going to help with the design of very large scale circuits, and I didn't know how. Every time I would go to Intel, I would go in and talk to the people and see what they were doing. I watched the way they designed their integrated circuits. They designed the circuit diagram, and then there was a draft person who would painfully, on a sheet of mylar that was typically this big, that had little squares on it, would draw all five layers, one on top of the other, for the entire circuit by hand. Then that piece of mylar was put on a light table, and on top of it was put a thing called ruby lith. 
let's say that there was a, a, a stripe of the layer. They had to cut on both sides of the stripe and on the ends, and then they did that for every shape on that layer. And then after that was done, they would take a very fine pointed pair of tweezers and peel out the parts that represented that layer. And then you would go check the whole thing and then that ruby lath was used as a master at something like 200 times the final size of the chip. Well, in order to get those lines absolutely straight, you couldn't do it by hand. They had a thing called a coordinograph. It had effectively exacto knife blades in it. It had a knob on the X direction and a knob on the Y direction. So it was like an XY plotter, but you could set it by hand. So all the things you could do were, were Manhattan geometry, as it's called. I looked at this. I wanted to make these things. I wanted to design these things myself. I believed it was possible because conceptually it wasn't difficult. What was difficult is the way they were doing it. And they were the best in the field. It has to be a better way. So did anybody else make precision patterns? We had all of the aerospace industry around here that makes military specifications, printed circuit boards for circuits that went into aircraft and rockets and all that stuff. Why don't I find out how they make their circuit boards? Well, it turns out that the way everybody made their layouts was to use a thing called a Gerber plotter. And there were commands for this. It was called Gerber code. And what it was, was you select a aperture, then you go to where you want it to start, you turn it on, you draw from one XY position to another till you're at the end, and you turn it off. That's not hard. So I started writing Gerber code. Well, I can't afford a Gerber plotter either, and it was a big thing. You had to have it in a dark room, of course, because what you put down was mylar that, was, uh, that had photographing emulsion on it. It was basically a great big photographic negative. And then you drew on it all in the dark. And when it was done, you ran it through a, a, a photographic development process. So I couldn't afford to do that and I couldn't have the time to do all that. Well, it turned out we're in Southern California. There are job shops that do it for the military people. You can hire a Gerber plotter by the hour. So I went down, there was one down in El Monte, and I went down and got to know the guy. He had his own little shop there and knew what he was doing. The Gerber plotter had logic in it, of course, to interpret all this stuff. It was, it was individual transistors on circuit boards. It was probably already 15 years old. That's when I learned you're always using the last generation of technology to make the next generation of technology. That's just the name of what you do. By writing a program, I had created a pattern myself that was precise. And I didn't need a light box, and I didn't need a drafts person, and I didn't need a ruby lith, and I didn't need a coordinograph, and I didn't need a team of people to do all this. I could just do it. So this is what came out of, of the Gerber plotter that, that we would go and, and give paper tape to. So these are the contact pads. This is a, this is a metal layer, the, the blue one. And uh, you can tell a lot from just looking at it. These are the, there's VDD, the power supply and ground. And then these are the, the drivers that are going to drive the pads. These are the pads that you make a contact to with a wire that goes off to inside of a package, which are the things you see that have integrated circuits in them. It's changed my life. Great. I knew there had to be a whole new way of implementing digital functions that was more 
regular, that was more structured than what we now call random logic, just NAND gates and NOR gates and flip-flops and you hook them all together, which worked fine for little things, but when you get to anything complicated, it becomes just a hopeless mess. So I had a student then, freshman, I'd been in my freshman logic class and was a super bright guy, I'd named Steve Colley. And I told him what I was doing and I said, you know, we can, we can make these, these shapes and we can make arrangements that will create logic functions. He got very excited about this. So we agreed that I would write the code that would generate the artwork and he would write the code that would take that same input, make a logical program from it that did the function of that. So that led me to the invention of the thing we now call the programmable logic array. It ended up, of course, that I wasn't the only one that had this idea. There was a guy down at Texas Instruments and another guy at Hewlett Packard. We had all independently invented this thing. That was a big aha for me. I can make a simple, regular arrangement that can generate any logic function. This structure then became a way of doing logic that I could realize I could do all the electronic design, I could get the timing right, I could do everything like that without regard to what exact function was being done. And then I could program that function later. So it became programmable. So I realized this is my version of Stan Frankel's LGP30. In miniature, it's a finite state machine as realized in a regular structure that you can generate with a silicon compiler. So that was the inspiration for this not just being a specific thing, but a very general way to do logic. So if you thought about it carefully, you could map the logic onto these very regular functions and it ended up much later being shown that this actually resulted in a, in a smaller and faster chip than doing it with random logic. It just opened my mind because I'm very close to the general purpose computer here. This is a picture of my first chip. And you can see the AND section here on the left the very bottom thing, you see the storage. That was a shift register that had the number of bits that there were digits plus a couple for the counting of extra. The white areas are the bonding pads that, where the wires come off to the outside world. Just for scale, I should show you what these chips actually look like. In order to have some illustration made it clear what it was doing, I decided to program this thing to be a 12-hour clock. So it would display the seconds, 0 up to 59, and the minutes, 0 up to 59, and then hours, 1 up to 12. Because it's a general logic function. It doesn't care that there's a special case for 12 and 1 and all of that. It was just all built in the code. That's what all those ones in there are. They're taking care of the entire sequence. They're taking care of adding. They're taking care of making sure you don't have a zero in front of the one when it's 1 o'clock in the morning. So now we'll go over to the lab and we'll have a chance to actually see this very chip, my very first one, working. So what I'm gonna show you is 
exactly the same chip in a package that's very, very similar to the ones that I put the chips in myself back in 1971. And it's being tested in very much the same way. There wasn't a setting mechanism built in the chip. I wasn't developing a commercial clock. I was developing a general purpose structure that this was a demonstration for. And to do that, you actually have to display the output. Well, I had built the chip to work with this little fluorescent tube. It was designed in such a way that the chip could drive the signals on the tube all by itself. It didn't need any external drivers or anything like that. And that was an important part of the demonstration that you could do the entire task that needed to be done with this one structure. If it was really a general purpose structure, you should be able to do all of that. So I hooked up the digit lines to the digits on the tube, and I hooked up the segment lines to the segments on the tube, and that's all done. This is a little thing called a prototype board, and all it is is a place to stick wires into, and uh, there are little pieces of metal underneath that connect the wires together. Each of the little wires from the tube is hooked up to the appropriate pin on the chip. We had six pins, one for each of the digits to tell you what digit you were on. And there's seven pins that tell you what segments you should light for that digit. So the purple trace on the scope is the A segment. So if you think about the digits, the A segment will be on for everything but one, which is B and C, and four, which has those segments, and the rest of the time it will be on. So if you watch the signal here, for the first digit, when we get to zero, there's one, two, three, four. So that's the way it works for all the digits. It was fun doing this once I had satisfied myself that the chip was actually working because I had thought through all of these cases and worked them through in my head. And so I had to check out all the places I could have made a mistake because there was no way to run a simulation through the whole thing all that long. So I would go to the to the critical places in the simulation and run them from just a few cycles to see if it did the right thing. What I want to do is I would like to get it to nine so I can see if it goes from nine to 10 because then that'll invoke the next digit. Well, I want to make sure that works right. And there we went over to 10, double O, double O, just like it, it ought to be. So that was the key one to see if you get the next digit because you remember that had not been a zero, that was just blank. So the next one had to go from 11 to 12, not to zero. Because if it were counting in any reasonable system, it, it would go to 11, 59, 59, and it would be zero hours. In fact, there are some people that reckon time that way. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve, double O, double O. So it didn't go to zero, it went to 12 like it should have. Okay. So now we've got to see if it goes from 12 to one instead of zero, which it would if it was an ordinary digital counter. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. There we go. And it went to one, double O, double O. No zeros up here. And it didn't go to zero, zero, zero. It went to one, zero, zero, because that's the way we tell time. This was the test I did for my very first chip. By the end of that first day, I had it doing this. And I realized that I had a way of generating VLSI designs that worked, not because I had crawled all over them by hand, but because they were generated in a 
structured way so that once you checked out the structure, then it was the contents of the code in the structure that made it do its function. So that was the beginning of the switch from the physics and then the realization of a transformation from idea to an architecture to a logic structure to a programming of the logic structure to a realization of the chip first in a mask and then on the silicon and then in a real living part. That was this little chip right here. Then I realized I did understand something about designing these things and it was a thing that was not being done. That was a big thing for me. And that started the class, it started the, the whole move of getting a computer science group started and getting us to be the leadership place in the world for teaching new generations of students how to do design of arbitrarily complex integrated circuits.